Take your Bibles, if you would, turn back to the book of Numbers. I want you to pray for Brother Wilkerson, and I trust that he'll get back on his feet and get well again shortly, but I do appreciate the honor of preaching to you, and thank you so much for encouraging our new pastor, and he's not our new pastor anymore. He's been here well over a year and just done such a wonderful job as a staff member. I can speak on behalf of all the staff members. We truly enjoy working for him and with him in this ministry here, and we're so pleased. I want you to look at back at Numbers chapter 16. In verse 1, I'm just going to read a couple verses, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to keep our Bibles open and read many more as we tell the story here, one of the most unique stories in all the Bible. But I'm going to read the first few verses again, first couple verses. Now, Korah, the son of Ishhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. So you have the first person there whose name was Korah, and it gave then his family, his family lineage there shortly. Then he had Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On. The son of Pelath, the son of, sons of Reuben, took men. So you have, first of all, the first man there was Korah, and he got a couple other boys to go with him, Dathan and Abiram. In verse 2 it says, And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said, Ye take too much upon you. So here you had one man that got, uh, he just got himself out of sorts. Something got him upset. His job was to take care of the furniture of the tabernacle, and something went wrong. Somebody said something something to him, and maybe somebody put him down and called him a slave of some kind, and or we don't know exactly what was said, but something got, uh, got under his saddle, and it began to irritate him, and he found a couple other men, and he got them irritated. They found a whole bunch more and got a whole crowd irritated. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Happens all the time and has continued happening ever since this very day. Let's pray and we'll talk about it tonight. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for your goodness and thank you for this church. We ask your blessings to be upon the service tonight. Help us to learn some lessons from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here are these 250 princes, the Bible calls them, of the assembly. It says, famous in congregation men of renown. So these were good men. These weren't uh, just, uh, you know, these weren't men that uh, were basically novice necessarily. They were good men. They were well respected, favored above all the people. And uh, all of a sudden, something went awry in their heart and their soul. It started with, with Korah, ended up going to Dathan and Abiram, and then to the 250 men. And they gathered themselves against Moses. And when Moses heard this, now you got to understand something. This is after a long period of, of many great things that they got to see and partake of. They saw the plagues in, uh, in Egypt. They saw the crossing of the, uh, of, of the Red Sea. They, they saw a lot of great things, the hand of God in ways that you and I have never seen. They saw it all firsthand. And all of a sudden they get ticked at Moses who, by the way, seemed to be well favored by God. And then they go to him with a, a, a group of other men, and they conspired against him, saying, look, we really don't care for your leadership. And you take upon yourself too much authority, and uh, we, uh, we want to elect leadership for ourselves." is basically what they were saying. In verse 4, I want you to look at it. I want you to read it with me, verse 4, all together now. Ready? And when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. Read verse 5 also. And he spake unto Korah and to all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show unto his, our his, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him who he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Now, you got to understand. Now, Moses, then he sets the stage. He says, he says, I'll tell you what, we're going to go to God for this, and we're going to let God decide. Now, now let's go back in time. I won't take much time to do this, but Moses, he didn't go and to God and say, look, I'll tell you what, I, our people are aff afflicted, and I, I want to lead them out for you. God called him. He didn't go to God and call God. 
He was chosen by God to do a specific duty and, and even tries his best to get out of it and says, God, I, I'm not well spoken. I, I don't know what to, what to do. I don't, the people aren't going to listen to me. And God says, all you have to do is go and I'll take care of everything else. And so he does, and boy, just a lot of great things happen, and ten plagues, and the crossing of the Red Sea, and, and now all of a sudden these men are upset, and they begin to chide with him. And I want you to look, if you would, into verse, verse 6, says, this do. In other words, Moses says, take you censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that whom, whom, uh, the, the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. And then Moses points his finger in his face and says, you take too much upon yourself, because you're about to see something. He said, now I want you to get some censers, and these were some, some brazen pots that would hold some in, burning incense in it and on a stick. And he says, I want you to bring them, and tomorrow we'll let the Lord to, to decide who is holy or who is set apart, whose job it is to lead the people. In verse 8, Moses said unto Korah, Hear, I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you, that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. This isn't the message, but what you know what happens when you get out of sorts, what happens is Satan has got you, got you looking away from the good things God has given you. The good opportunities that God has for you, he gets you to look away from that and looks upon the burden that you're now sharing. And that's where it starts, and all of a sudden the bitterness starts, and it starts to, to just to rub on you, and pretty soon you'll find other folks that'll listen to you. Misery, misery never stays alone. Always finds somebody else to, to, to hold its company and to be miserable with them. Look in verse 10, if you would, please. And he hath brought these, uh, uh, brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and, and seek ye the priesthood also. For which cause both thou and thy company are gathered together against the Lord, and, and what is Aaron, that ye murmur against him? And he goes, and I can't even believe you're going to gripe against Aaron, what a great servant he has been. Don't you understand? And now Moses is trying to be a pastor here. He's trying to let these guys know, listen, get off before you try to get, get on here. You're trying to go up against God, and I'm begging you, when you start, start chiding on Aaron, a great servant, a humble man of God, you're really going too far. It's one thing to criticize me, but don't go after Aaron. And he's God's man, and I, I promise you, this is not going to work well, uh, well for you. You really have bitten off more than you can chew. And then he says in verse 12, And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. And Moses goes to them, and he does the scriptural thing. He answers these men, and he, said, and he wants, and they won't come. They're dug in. They said, We're not going to Moses. We're ticked at him. In verse 13, it is a small thing that thou hast brought up to us out of the land that floweth milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us in the land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us an inheritance of our fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? Uh, will we not come up? We will not come up. In other words, he's, he's saying, we're not in the promised land yet. We, we, you were told us, you're, and now we're in the wilderness, we, you're, you're going to send us to the promised land. And all of a sudden, these men, they start buying into the griping and complaining and get impatient with God. They were going to get to the promised land one day, but they had to do it in God's terms. And all of a sudden now, they're trying to not just take over Moses and Aaron's responsibilities. Now, in, in many respects, they're chiding God personally, which they're doing anyhow by going after Moses and Aaron. Now look, I want you to look down in verse 14. Moreover, thou hast not brought, uh, verse 15, and Moses was very wroth, and he said, uh, said unto the Lord, respect thou, respect not, not, not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, 
be, be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow. And take every man his censer and put incense in them and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, two, 250 censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon, and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the, Lord of the, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Now listen carefully. The glory of the Lord, a cloud of light came down here and God began to speak to Moses and Aaron and if you know I'm not the brightest star in the sky and I mean that but I, that would have gotten my attention if I'd have been holding this brazen this brazen uh, uh, sensor in my hand standing there ready for God to decide who is going and God saying to Moses and Aaron hey I want you to step back I believe I would have followed suit with that. I don't care who Dathan was and who Abiram was or who Korah was. But these men stood their ground. They stood with this little insurrection. They stood with these, these rebellious men. In verse 20, and the Lord spake unto spake in Moses, saying, uh, and, and to Aaron, rise, separate yourselves from among the congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin? And, w and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speaking to the congregation, saying, get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. In other words, Moses fell on his face. He didn't move back. He said, oh God, please, I beg you, don't do this. And Moses, who loved his people and was begging for these people to listen to God and begging for God to not do this to them, and God says, all right, I'll give you another chance. Speak to them again. And Moses uh, rose up and went into Dathan and Abram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake into the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. <clears throat> Touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. This is their houses. And on every side, and Dathan and Abram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. Boy, I'll tell you what, you don't, you don't go into this kind of sin all by yourself. You just, you start dragging another person, another person, your wife, your children, all in with you here now. And so they got up from the tabernacle of Korah and Dathan and Abram on every side. Abram and on every side, and Dathan and Abram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have done, I have not done them of my own mind. In other words, I didn't set me up. This is God working now. God is going to do what he is going to do here. And God is going to show none of this. It's out of my control. I want you to understand that. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain, that's an important word, appertain, we'll come back to that, unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And now here it comes. That word appertain, it basically means that those that belong to. These men that, that had decided to, to be a part of that team, that crowd, that group, that appertain. In verse 31 it says, And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses. And all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. The Bible doesn't say, but I believe their children and their families were in their houses as well. Doesn't say. And, but, but, but if not, their children, their families saw the most horrible sight they've ever seen. 
a sight that they will never forget. They saw the ground open up. They saw fire come out, fire that came out so hot it melted the sensors. And to where the sensors melted flat into just molten brass on the ground, which God had them pick up the next day and to beat into a tablecloth to put in the tabernacle so they would never forget that day. And I imagine it in the hearts and minds of all those children and those families and those wives and those relatives <coughs> as they saw their dads being consumed by fire and fall into the pit never to be seen from again. That, that, that picture, those sounds, that rumbling of that earth, the, the heat from that fire, they will never ever forget. They, that all, uh, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. Good idea. Great idea. Let's get out of here. Exit stage right and left. Exit back door, front door. Let's get out of here. God is serious about this. And these men have done something terribly wrong, and let's be mindful of this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto, um, I want to look in verse 35, and there came out fire from the Lord, and consumed the 250 men that offered the incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning. And, uh, and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed in the censers of these sinners against their own souls. Let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar, for they offered them before the Lord. Therefore they are hallowed, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. And so that is an incredible story. Amen. Incredible story. And man, it just ends with an incredible ending of fire and, and, and the ground opening up and the fire coming out and killing the men that were standing around <coughs> and melting these, these sticks and these brazen censers. And then uh, God telling Moses to have Eliezer go and pick those up and let's make some plates and coverings for the, in the tabernacle so that the, they will never be forgotten. A lot was talked about at supper that night. A lot of things happened around Israel that day and, and the children of Israel and around, around that encampment. And boy, wouldn't you have thought that throughout all of that, that time and through what that great expression of God's power that everybody would have got their heart right with God? I would have too, but that's not how it turned out. Let's read on. Look at verse 41. On the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel did what? What's that word? Murmured. Isn't that unbelievable? You know, the last thing I would have done was criticize God at that point in time. And it wasn't just a few, it was, the Bible says, all. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. Now, didn't Moses just say a little while ago, this is not my doing, this is God's doing. This wasn't Moses' doing, this was God's doing. And all of a sudden, now all of a sudden the people are saying, Moses, look what you've done, you've killed our friends. you destroyed them. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation and behold, the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. God comes back now and he's really ticked. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, get you up from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell on their faces. In other words, they begged God. God says, I am sick and tired of these griping, complaining Israelites and I'm done with them. I'm going to send them all where I sent the other men. And you know what? And this is it. Stand back. And Moses and Aaron fall on their face and they begin to beg God. 
And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord, the plague is begun. <coughs> they fell on their face and, and said, Oh God, please help us. And then Moses turns to Aaron and says, Listen, you run as fast as you can, you go get a censer, you put some incense into it, and, fi and fire, and I want you to go to the people and I want you to beg them to repent and I want you to give atonement for them. Hurry! God has begun to afflict our people. The plague has begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. Behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put, incense, put on incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague, in that very short time, the time it took for Aaron to go and get a censer, fill it full of incense, and go make atonement, in that short time, 14,707 people, 14, people beside them that died about the matter of Korah. You talk almost 50, a total of almost 15,000 people died. Because of what? One man. One man. 250 princes became the, the army or the team of this one man after he got two cohorts to go with him. These men were somebody. They were good men. Their spirits became tainted. They didn't like something about their duty or their job. And I want to tell you something. When people get tainted or they get afflicted or they, they get hurt by somebody, it doesn't really matter what it is. When it gets into your heart and soul, it's a dangerous thing. And you'll find a reason for it. It doesn't matter. It's not the carrying of the furniture. Everybody has to do something in life. It happened to be something that they didn't like. And they, instead of dealing with it properly, they began to gripe and complain. And Moses, through his grieving, tried his best to talk these people out of what they were doing and uh, to no avail. And finally, God stepped in and cast judgment. And the people then began to murmur and gripe and complain. And all of a sudden, God says, you know what? I'm sick and tired of all of you. And God sent a plague. And Moses then gave atonement for that plague. And God stayed the plague. And still, some almost 15,000 people died. All because... All because of the influence of one person. It's sad to see what can be done by those who get incensed about the wrong kinds of things. Influence is an important part of our life. I'm going to make an illustration here, if I may. Um, Brother Froke, could you get me two of those, actually three of those glass, glasses there for me, please? I'm going to show you just a quick illustration here, if I may. And how, how important uh, influence is. And I'm going to need one more glass, if you don't mind. Now, <clears throat> these glasses, Mrs. Colston does a very good job of making sure we have some very clean and, and uh, good water up here. Yes, thank you. And... Uh, and obviously, I, I know I've watched you out there sometimes during a service and it gets really hot and you see us take a drink of water and I see you going, <laughs> wishing you could have one and I, I enjoy mine all the more at that point in time. <laughs> but you take, you take um, influence and it's as simple as this. Influence in a, in a clear glass of water, all you need, this is, this is just regular food coloring. And one drop into that, and I don't know if you can zoom in on that, uh, you camera guys, if you can figure that one out. <clears throat> I don't have to stir that up. Just from the carrying the water up, there's enough motion in that water, and one drop of that food coloring begins to dissolve and begins to mix with that. That's what influence is. And it works slowly, and it starts just a little bit. That's one drop compared, compared to that whole glass of water. One drop is seemingly insignificant, but, but it colors that, that whole 
that whole uh, bottle. It didn't matter if I had a gallon jug or a pitcher of water. One drop would taint the whole thing eventually. And the longer I speak, the more it will dissolve around and fill that thing. And let's just let that blue be... Um, be bad influence and the influences that come into your 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 life through a bad way. This red will represent the good influences, and likewise, one drop just goes into that, and eventually it will start start to mix with that water. So here you have here you have one drop of influence that is bad, and it, and it could be it could be a, a song, it could be a friend, it could be a statement that just uh, uh, made from some some preacher that literally got got them turned aside and turned them off to the rest of the preaching, and it could be a Sunday school teacher that said the wrong thing or a friend that looked at their girlfriend the wrong way, and something like that can influence their spirit, and it doesn't take long until it in, it just encompasses every part of us. Then you have the good influences. Likewise, it doesn't take but one word from a preacher. We have Brother Kurt Copeland coming <coughs> to preach to our teenagers tomorrow and uh, through Thursday. Moms and dads, you know, we, we do our best to find the best influences that we can and hoping that that one word that he says or an illustration or his personality or something that will provoke the heart will, will stick into a kid's life and begin to, to grow and mesh with them and help them to become what they ought to become. But these two influences are, they're visible. We can see those. You, you tell your children, now this is a bad influence. Stay away from that. That's not good. That movie is bad. That music is wrong. That young man, he's not good for you. And young people, God has given your parents some clear cut, cut uh, uh, views about, about personalities, the through personalities and through character where they can look at the measure of a young man or a, a person and say, he's good, he's bad, he's not right and so forth. And you need to listen to that. That's that's what, those are the visible things. Moms and dads, that's why it's important that, that your children, I, that's why I believe in Christian education, to where we put into the hearts and minds every day things that, that help young people discern between the good and the bad. Then there's, there's the invisible, the invisible influences that you cannot see, the Holy Spirit. There are things that moms and dads, you can't, you, you don't know that are influencing your kid in a good way. To where somebody has done something kind for them and put just, a, just a, a, some, some good things into them. And, and I, poured, uh, I poured some good water in, into that. And out of this, you just a little bit went in. You couldn't see it. There's nothing missing there. But there are good qualities in that water that, help, that would help your young people or, or you as an adult or me. To quench my thirst and strengthen my body. And these things are of God. They're of the Lord. And these are the things that you pray for. Then there are some influences that you can't see that are evil. These are the Korah kind of influences. This, in this jug here, if I leave it up here, please do not drink it. It is taken from, literally, the toilet in my bathroom. Attention. Evacuation plan A. And all I'm doing is putting one drop in there. Please exit the building. And Brother Colston, since you're feeling so healthy tonight, would you like to take a drink of this? Uh, you can't see it mixing in there, but it's doing exactly what these two did. That's why it's important, moms and dads, you, you know who your children are hanging around. It's why it's important you know where they're sitting. It's why it's important you know what they're listening to. You know what they're watching. Dads, it's why it's important your wife knows what you're watching and what you're doing and where you're going. Husbands, it's important that you know what your wife is doing because the, the subtle influences that come into a person's life like this cannot be seen. And you say, Brother Lapina, how do you, how do you, how do you discern that? These, these are possibly seen, and you know, though many times even the Israelites didn't see the obvious, <clears throat> they stuck with the bad, they knew that these guys were, were dirty, and, uh, but, but though Dathan and Abiram, they didn't see this right out of the gate. They thought Korah was just a good man. He was a choice, choice servant and a man of renown, and they were somebody. And so maybe they could do something great for Israel was their thinking, but there was literally some poison in there. Something that was making their, their spirit very, very sick and unhealthy. You say, how do you know the difference? Just a couple quick things. 
what Moses did, Moses fell on his face and he began to pray to God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The prayer meetings that we have, your prayer times are vital and important. Because it's through the begging of God to help you see the unseen things and let the Holy Spirit influence you in the right way. And the prayer is so vital to, 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 uh, to identifying these things that you don't even know are there. There are many times my mother and my dad said to me, you know, uh, I don't want you going to a certain place. And I would ask the inevitable question, why? And you know what? They never could give me a good answer. But they said, you know, we just don't feel what? Right about it. We just don't think it's a good idea. Why isn't it a good idea? Because you know what? We just don't feel right about it. And there were times, and of course, in our house, you didn't sass mom and dad back. If you did, you didn't eat very well or you ate through a straw for the next six weeks. But, but we learned as a young age not to sass them. And so if they said, you know what? You're not going. It's, it was the law. We just didn't ask and we didn't go or we didn't do or we didn't say any more about it. <clears throat> but inevitably, I would wonder why in the world, you know, any other day my parents would let me go. Any other day they would let me be with those guys. Any other day I could date that girl. But you know what? They, they said something's wrong about that. And that's through prayer. That's through moms and dads speaking to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit speaking to them. Young people, you've got, you've got a lot of life ahead of you, and you're easily influenced by a lot of things that you don't really see the wrong end. You don't see the bad there. You've not watched so, as much as many of the adults have, and so you have to have a lot more trusting in you. You have to have the character in you to see those things. And that's why you need to pray. And you need to ask God to guard your soul. You need to ask God to help your parents and your leaders to, 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 to guide you and to help oversee your life. Spend time in prayer. As Moses did, Moses also spent time Seeking God's word. He wanted God to speak. God, what shall I do? God has given us his word. That's why this book, the Bible says in Psalms, the lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The lamp unto our feet allows us to see, see who we are and where we are. A light unto our path allows us to see where we're going. And the word of God is a discerner of truth. And by spending time reading this book, all of a sudden you'll get the idea, you know what? I, I, I don't really see anything wrong with that song. I don't see anything wrong with its beat, but it just doesn't affect me right. Maybe I ought not take from that one. This looks like a better deal for me. Now, you can look at some music and say, boy, that is definitely wrong. I can tell by the lyrics and the music itself, and it is, it is visibly, visibly heinous. But this, I don't know, it's grieving my spirit, it's grieving my soul. And that comes through spending time in prayer and spending time in this book. And thirdly, by listening to those that God has put in place to watch for their souls. Moses begged, begged Abiram. Begged his family, get away, listen to me, pay attention. And instead of listening to the man that was, that was literally fell on his face between them and God and said, God, please give me another moment with them. Let me speak to them. Let me help them. And they decided not to listen and suffer the consequences. God has given you spiritual leaders. God has given you teachers. God has given you Sunday school teachers, and God has given you coaches and school teachers and principals and staff folks here and, and preachers and pa a pastor that literally spends, we spend our life watching for your souls. Doesn't mean that we're perfect. Doesn't mean that we're even close to it. Moses himself, he, he, he fell humbly before God. He said, I didn't, I didn't put myself in this position. I didn't ask for this job. God placed me here. He spoke to me one night through a very, very pointed uh, offering uh, upon a bush in, in the wilderness. And God asked me to do this. I didn't want to go to the rulers of Egypt. I didn't want to talk to them. But God had me do so. And he humbly let the people know this wasn't about him. It was about their relationship with God. And if I may, God has given us a pastor with the same kind of spirit. And if he says, you know what, you need to watch out for this. 
you can't see the, the harm in there, but you know what? The Holy Spirit has pricked my soul and said something's wrong in that. Teenagers, you want to sing a certain style of music, and I was talking to Miss Wilson this morning, and she says, I've gotten on so many of our kids because I can't tell them exactly what's wrong with it, but, it, but I don't like the way that it affects me. That's God using a spiritual leader to let you know that, you know what, maybe we can't see it as well as you can see this, but you ought to pay attention because the end result is the same. And young people, if I may, and adults alike, that's why it's important for you to ground yourself in this book. Amen. Ground yourself in prayer. And put yourself in a place where you can hear the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. It all goes back to the first verse that we read in chapter 16. Now, Korah, one man, caused the death of 15,000 people, possibly more. Imagine they thought about Korah for a long time as they, as, as they mourned over their, their relatives. As they went to 15,000 funerals. As they grieved over 15,000 of their loved ones who died and burned or died of the plague, a disease sickness. I'm going to tell you something. If, if you are, you get yourself into a place to where something has pricked your soul and you're out of sorts, I'm begging you, follow the same advice here that Moses was trying to do. Go, go to this book right here. Ask the Bible. God has given you just as much a right to pray as he's given me. You have just as much access to him as I do. And go to godly people who care about you. Men that have humility and know God's word. And lay it out before them. And let them help you deal with it. And don't let pride take over like he did for these men. Because pride always results in a fall. Let's bow our head and close our eyes if you may. I don't know exactly how this message has affected you tonight. We have our teenagers that will go to revival service this week, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will <clears throat> help some of these young people who have some definite, some of them who have some bitterness towards their parents, towards authority. Things have gone wrong in their life, in their heart. And I beg that, like, like Moses begged for the children of Israel, begged for time for God, for them to, to get over it, for them to seek God's face. I don't know what you're struggling with tonight, but in just a moment, our musicians are going to play and sing. We're going to stand. This altar is yours. You come deal with God as you feel like you should. But if God has pricked your heart tonight, don't just stand there. Don't just say, well, maybe I'll get over it. I'll deal with this in my own way. Korah dealt with it in his own way, and it was the wrong way. You got to deal with it God's way and let God work in your heart and soul. Let's all stand to our feet with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our musicians.